you have any questions from the floor? If not, I have questions from our uh, participants online. Uh, yes, please go ahead. Yes. Uh, please okay. introduce yourself and you before. Hello, I'm Jennifer Ray Pierce. I'm with the Urban Biodiversity Hub. And I heard a few of the speakers mention different targets and systems that you're using to measure your progress. Um, one of the things that we do at Urban Biodiversity Hub is to investigate what cities are doing in terms of what they claim their actions would be, and then what um, they're using to measure those actions. And we find that there's a lot more claims of action then there are measurements to um, monitor progress along that action. Um, and so when we've been looking at developing tools, we tend to, instead of using targets, we follow trends and encourage cities to have a positive trend towards the direction they want to head. Um, but I did hear a lot of people mention particular targets. So I'm interested in knowing how you can um, establish targets in a way that work across different cities with different contexts and how you're dealing with that challenge. Thank you. Who wants to start? I know everybody has an answer to that question. Yes. <laughs> I love that question. Thank you. I mean, I think the short answer is there's no perfect, good, amazing way to do it, right? So when we established the Urban Nature Accelerator, we had a few goals. We wanted it to be achievable to cities in the global north and global south. Um, but that meant that there are some cities, is, is it right, Laura, that Sao Paulo has 48% tree coverage? Was, were you sharing that stat? Yeah, yeah so, so Sao Paulo already, you know, is far ab ahead of, of the target that we've set. And there are many other cities that are far ahead. And there are other cities that perhaps will need significant investment to be able to achieve that target. So, um, I don't think that these targets are the be all and end all. You know what I mean? I think for us, they're a tool that we are trying to use to build momentum, to move trends, as you say, in the right direction. Um, and uh, uh, yes, I think perhaps we need a number of different approaches to, to these, these pieces. At the, on the other hand, let's set some targets and work towards them uh, rather than, you know, we, we really struggle to do that with nature. So let's, let's choose some that are imperfect and, 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 uh, and then improve them as, as we go. Eric and then uh, Laura. Well, thanks, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, no, we have to. Uh, we have to set targets and we have to set targets in a way that we can actually measure them. Uh, and so there are a number of tools, like, for instance, the Nature Accelerator. The Urban Nature Accelerator has set, you know, a number of very, very clear targets. We signed on to it. And in 2023, we actually have to start reporting. Yeah. Uh, and so we tie that. One of our major, you know, sort of standards is the, the CDP tool from ECLEC, um, where they actually measure. Yeah, sort of the level of climate resilience um, against a set of targets. Now, we, at the moment, as a city, I'll just say it all out loud, yeah, we are at a C, right? Mm -hmm. The lowest you can get is a D. The reason that we've been at a C is because we do not have or had not had a climate action plan. We've been working for the last one year, and in early January, we will launch, yeah, a climate action plan. We've been working closely with C40 cities, with uh, Urban Shift, and it's fantastic. We've got, a, it's from 2022 uh, up to, where are we taking it, to 2030, right? Uh, and so we have a, a plan that that is quantifiable, yeah? And we've tied that plan to the various reporting dynamics that are out there. So that plan is in line with our commitments under the, the Urban Nature Accelerator. It's in your sort of, um, it's aligned to our commitments that we've made to actually be measured, your sort of globally across your sort of all of the cities in the world <laughs> under the CBD. So within the context of that, there are these kinds of, it's difficult for a number of cities to be able to do it because in order to be able to, your sort of measure, yeah, you actually first have to set these targets. They actually have to be clear. They have to be published. 
right? And you actually have to have uh, systems in place to do the measurement. Uh, and one of the places where you start, you know, is with, say, for instance, you know, sort of, it starts from a mitigation perspective, but it also looks at adaptation, right? And mainly it's geared toward looking at adaptation. But uh, in order to understand any of this, you have to have a city based and not a national um, greenhouse gas emissions you know, sort of uh, inventory. Uh, and so we did that in 2018 that set the baseline for us to be able to move and set you know, sort of a set of targets where we can and use tools that we can actually measure, go to sort of global you know, recognized entities that would actually do the measurement you know, sort of based on you know, sort of the work that would come, the data that we're collecting out of our process. So we as a city, we made that commitment. It's not easy, particularly for low resource cities like ours to do that. Uh, this is why it's important for us to be able to have partnerships like the partnership we have with C40, like the partnership we have with e Clay. Yeah. Thank you, Eric. Yeah. Laura? First, I'd like, I want to say that I like it very much to hear what you do. I think we need this. We who are in the governments or in some way a different responsibility about it. What I would like to highlight is the use of word claim. Because, yeah, yeah. this is, I think this is a very good use, but we need to see that there are some documents, some things that, as I said, 48% of uh, coverage, pre coverage in the theater. This has academic background, this has methodology and such things. This is what it is. Uh, and then it's not a problem besides of the methodology. But when we say claim, this is a political will. I do this or that. Yeah? And what um, I, I bring to you here is that we have there in Sao Paulo, since I guess 2004 around, each mayor, when elected, in three months, he must say what he will concrete, concretely do, how this can be measured, when he will do, who answers for it, and there is a committee which accompany uh, the work and the development and the producing of all public information about those things. Then uh, cities claim or governments claim um, this can be seen there in Sao Paulo by this means that calls Programa de Metas, and this is a targets program. And there you see of the mayor has done or not what he claimed for. But besides that, this, we have other information that have not the same political weight. That's, uh, is there anyone else who wants to take on G? So uh, I also agree that's a really good question. So I didn't mention that we are using um, a Singapore a biodiversity, city biodiversity index that we are using to help cities to measure the, what you are doing in biodiversity and to see um, how they are improved. So um, it's a scores based with the 23 indicators. So um, during our um, uh, communication and also work with the uh, Chinese cities, they feel like our uh, this index is so complicated, like um, um, it's more like a self-evaluating, like uh, you have to um, provide your self-impression, like what you are doing on each indicator. And they said it's not really uh, compatible with what they are doing like domestically. So um, our, so 
uh, on the today that on our China Day, we actually launched a Chinese version of the Singapore Biodiversity Index, mm -hmm. kind of like uh, to uh, localize and uh, to make them more um, appropriate and suitable based on each um, different country's context. So I think uh, maybe when we are designing some bigger target, so I think uh, we never. Um, we never uh, short of the targets or any tools, but the problem is like the good one, the really useful ones that we can have. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can like uh, do it just start from like uh, the the people that who are really are using to to uh, have more uh, maybe more engagement, like uh, what the tools more uh, friendly use, or we should say like um, you prefer, and then based on these and deliver some tools that can really help them. So that's kind of a different way to decide the target and also the tools. So um, that's also something that we are plan to uh, think about in our future work. Yeah. So thank you. If I may just respond as well. <laughs> so uh, in UNEP, we see that there are a lot of targets and tools, uh, to be honest. And so our job under the UN Decade on Ecosystems Restoration, we hope, will, will be to work with all of these experts in the panel and who are not in the panel to um, align those targets and harmonize so that we can report to, and, and call on our national governments to accelerate action towards nature, to unlock financing for nature, for the various things that we want to do it for. Um, we have time for one more question, but I'd like to take a question from the online audience. Um, so the question is also quite relevant to everyone, including to um, Mexico City. How do you manage to maintain biodiversity uh, and, and what was written here is particularly urban forest in the midst of continuous urbanization and we have some very highly urbanized cities in the room. Um, but the question is, especially in rapidly urbanizing Africa as well. So, um, but everybody is, I think this is, this question is very relevant to all. Yeah, I'll start with Mexico City because I think. Uh, Gracias, Sharon. Do we have translation? Yes, we do. Okay. So okay. please, uh, for those, Please put on your um, um, headsets. Bueno, uno de los planteamientos que eh, nosotros hemos hecho. One of the things we have done in our city that have to do with the previous question that you asked eh, with regard to Mexico City, the, the change in approach in the cities has to be uh, stop looking at nature as a scenery, just as something that is there as a choreography thing that is outside, because one of the things that has happened in the cities is that they have ended up being barriers to establish uh, full ro roadways for nature. And so the way we have tried to reintroduce nature in the city of Mexico is to open up these blue and green uh, arteries to have real biodiversity corridors to enable people, human beings, to reconnect with nature. We need to realize that this is part of our daily life and nature, not just every Sunday or once a month when that you go and walk on the in the park or anything like that. It's important that one of the ways in which we can sustain this logic is with a with an accountability in terms of the indicators that we establish amongst these experts groups. But also we're talking about indicators. That is what people are looking at and can see day on a daily basis that allows us to be transparent with people and be sincere about what we committed to and whether or not we're advancing and in what way we're making headway. And that's the way we are changing the routes and we're changing the ways. And that needs to be seen inside within these blue and green arteries of the cities that we are constructing. Maybe just, just very quickly, I think in terms of maintaining it when we're, when we're thinking about this as well for some of these 
cities that may have half a million to a million people, but have highly um, have high urban growth rates in terms of population. It's of course not just about maintaining it; it's about instilling it as a model of urban mm -hmm. uh, of urban urban design. And I think that's particularly relevant to the question of sub-Saharan Africa. Right? Exactly. Is that you know we have to shift away from this. 20th century model for urbanization and make na you know make nature at the heart of it going forward and you know we're in low sort of resource environments where there's very high rates of urbanization and maybe you know urban energy access gaps as well that could not be more urgent i don't think so um yeah i would just say it's about transitioning to a new way of, of development and a new way of financing that urban development in sub-saharan africa yeah I, I absolutely agree with it. Um, it is, it's, it's an urban design issue, right? I mean, the, the way that we get more biodiversity and more green, you know, sort of greening within the context, you know, sort of, of rapidly urbanizing spaces is that we design it. Yeah. And we design it, you know, sort of through that growth and through, you know, sort of the, the, the citizens, the residents of those spaces. And we do so you know, with the context of equity. Right now in Freetown, we are piloting a process where we are using you know, sort of green ecological infrastructure, yeah, sort of in our mangrove spaces as a context for slum upgrading, yeah, within the context of you know, sort of a, a coastal slum that, that has hundreds, almost 100,000 people along that coast. Yeah? And this is the place where people come. And they're continuing to come. And in the next eight years, we're going to almost double our population again. Uh, and so we need to be, so the Freetown, the Treetown Initiative begins to look at how we actually change. It's really about, it's not about planting trees. It's about changing the relationship, you know, sort of between, you know, sort of people and nature in those spaces, regardless, right, of wealth. Right. Yeah. It's redefining those dynamics and building equity into those processes. Um, and just one last thing, sort of back with the idea of our claims. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's also within the context of how we use technology in that space. It's the social, technological, ecological, the sort of continuum that, you know, integration, you know, and, and designing new dynamics within it. And so, you know, right now we are in the process of, you're sort of building a new you're sort of tree map. We're also heat mapping as well, by the way. Um, and so all of those dynamics are actually coming together. And so we are every year looking at tree cover, you know, utilizing your sort of GIS, but we're actually building in drones so we can get a better picture. Uh, and so those and building a 3D model that we will then you know, sort of make public so everybody can see it and understand exactly where we are. Um, and, you know, sort of, we can be held accountable for, you know, sort of what actually is happening, but we can also use this as tools to attract resources. You know, cities, you know, like ours, you know, sort of these rapidly urbanizing poor cities in Africa are considered non-bankable. <laughs> That's one of the problems, yeah? And we need to create new relationships in order to become that, yeah? And some of those relationships are relationships among cities, yeah? Yeah. Well, yeah. Sao Paulo is a city that has suffered such a dynamic growth, and we need to think that uh, this is has to do with economics. It was not that one day some the people thought, "Let's go to the city." It's not this way, but and then to think how to conserve biodiversity in cities or everywhere. For instance, we are a local government, but we need uh, the Amazon forest to stand because we need water. Exactly. And the Amazon forest uh, is outside our competencies. And coming back to the dynamic growth, <clears throat> Uh, besides this economic and political uh, circumstances, I, I think that we need to have in mind that people living there in the trench of the, the growth, 
they see trees as not an not an enemies but they use a space that people need for themselves mm -hmm. and then this is this is inequality mm -hmm. and we need to think about it if we want the trees to stand inequality and for other example we had an an veterinary a veterinarian hospital, but in a region. People fought this hospital because they wanted a hospital for human beings first. Mm -hmm. And then when we think on biodiversity, we need to think on social relationships, on living conditions and such things. But I must say, and I am really experienced in those things. Uh, they know that we need tree. The same people that cut them in the cities, I would not say in the forest, and Amazon forest is very different. <laughs> but in the cities, they know they need them. Mm -hmm. But they must stay somewhere. And then the trees lose. We are now at the end of our event. I would like to give the floor to Gregor Robertson, Global Ambassador of the Global Covenant of Mayors and former mayor of Vancouver, for some concluding remarks. You have the inviolable task of <laughs> summarizing this rich discussion. Impossible task. Well, it's, uh, I'm honored to be here on behalf of the Global Covenant of Mayors, which is uh, the biggest network of cities uh, collaborating together on climate and energy. and. Uh, by logical extension, nature. We don't get there on climate and energy without nature being at the core of our actions. We have uh, over 12,000 cities, 12,600 cities now that are part of the global covenant. And at the core of the covenant is this accountability and transparency issue. All of these cities reporting their emissions annually and uh, completing climate action plans as part of, uh, of what you do to be part of the global covenant of mayors. So over a billion people now uh, live in the, in the cities and communities that are part of uh, Global Covenant. That's GCOM for short. Um, and so these are urban areas, but I, I just I want to highlight what our friend from Brazil, from Sao Paulo said, that cities uh, are where people are most concentrated, where we live. Uh, nature thrives the best when it has its own space. Uh, we don't survive in cities without nature being taken care of. So, you know, job one in cities is making sure that, that our wilderness, that biodiverse areas that are not in our cities are looked after because our cities are consuming biodiversity and nature across the planet. We have to stand up for all that nature that allows us to live in cities first and foremost. So that piece I think is, is very important. And then within our cities, we have to be smarter, greener, more dense, more equitable. We have to, this is where people are, have been coming for generations now and will continue. We're going from 50 odd percent right now, uh, living in cities uh, to two thirds in the next couple of decades, um, which will benefit some of nature if we keep taking care of it outside of cities. But that, that balance is really a critical piece. What we've seen in, uh, in our 2022 impact report, that's called Energizing Climate Action, uh, is that, and that brought data together from cities across the world, uh, that, that we are seeing escalating impacts uh, in cities everywhere. Uh, and it connects climate, impact on nature, impact on our climate and our people, uh, that the extreme weather events and sea level rise are increasing all over the world. Uh, and impacting our communities. The data is very, very clear right now. Over half of, uh, of our cities, the people in our cities feel that they are uh, at high risk of, of climate uh, impacts. So we're, we're seeing raised concerns across all of the cities in the, in the Global Covenant Network. Uh, we're seeing increased impacts, uh, and that is, is leading to more action. Um, we need to ensure that that action combines climate action with nature action. Uh, and I think that's why so many of us are here and why it's fantastic. UNEP and ICLEI, C40, the, all of these great networks that all of you are part of 
and the cities and communities that many of, uh, we all live in, but uh, many of us represent, uh, are coordinated and collaborating in this action to make sure climate and nature uh, flow together and, and we get a win-win from our actions. We are, um, we're seeing in the impact uh, report that the, the highest risk climate hazards uh, are related to heat in our cities. That's no surprise around this table. Uh, and obviously nature-based solutions, canopy uh, restoration is, is at, the, at the top of the list for solutions in terms of, of heat mitigation in our cities. Uh, flooding and sea level rise also massive, massive uh, impacts uh, just behind heat. And those, again, are where nature-based solutions can be deployed uh, to make a difference. So um, connecting these dots is, is not rocket science. I think uh, it's mm -hmm. very logical. The data backs all of it up. It really, it, it comes to the action side of this. Um, yes, on the target and uh, target setting, the action plans, the implementation of those, but it, it does rely on the engagement uh, with the community uh, equitable approaches that make sure there's the, the community has a reason to be engaged in this, that there are economic opportunities created from this, particularly, I think our friend from uh, Freetown really highlighted the importance of that. And, uh, and really, I'd say uh, the bottom line is the bottom line. There, there has to be more financial support for nature-based solutions in cities. We, we have to see that support come uh, urgently and you know we see the beginnings of those tools the beginnings of of more uh call for for climate finance and nature finance coming together for these solutions um i think we heard great examples um from from cities on every continent here i guess antarctica wasn't represented <laughs> but from uh from all of the continents we're seeing cities take action yes we hope there's more and more. We hope the reporting, the accountability and transparency continues to scale uh, and that there are really measurable outcomes. Uh, I would say from my city in Vancouver, we, we, had, uh, we made a commitment to be the greenest city in the world by 2020. And we created a, a big plan. 35,000 citizens were part of that plan. There was a lot of engagement and people knew, well, I can start, I can compost everything uh, from my house, all the organic material and divert that waste away from landfills or incinerators. I can plant trees in, in my yard. Uh, even the city can give me trees to plant in the yard. Uh, there are actions that were very real. Greenhouse gas emissions are very nebulous and hard for people to connect to. What, like, uh, nature is much more direct, much more clear <laughs> and hands-on for delivering personal change and solutions and, and feeling good about it. I think that engagement and the the connection to nature, I think, will be really important uh, for our solutions. So we, we heard lots of great work that's taking place. I think our, uh, our next step is to be inspired and motivated by all that we've heard, to take that back to our communities, to our cities, uh, and to take it to our national governments and say, you need to fund nature-based solutions to tackle the climate and energy and, and nature crisis that we have in all of our cities and communities. So. We need more resor uh, resources to get this work done together. We know how to mobilize on the ground. Let's uh, take it to the next level, uh, pushing for that support around the world. Thank you to you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gregor, for ending on such a high note um, uh, and for bringing the human element. Before we end, just one last thing. I want to acknowledge our colleagues who are not physically here in Montreal, but have been doing all of the heavy lifting. Um, I, don't, you, I won't be able to show you their pictures, but Irene, um, uh, Elsa, Sophie, and Lily, thank you very much. They are working together on uh, the city's unit of UNAP, on Urban Shift, and the Cool Coalition. Uh, this is uh, the last event of our team for a ver uh, in a very intense year. So. Thank you very much for joining this. We celebrate now and we're off to holidays. Thank you very much.